So thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Wendy and I uh, both are at schools where we have some very strong industry partnerships that we're looking forward to share with you today. Um, just as we begin, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today uh, all across Australia. For in my case, I'm meeting on Gungaloo people's land and their elders past, present and emerging. So I guess, Given that we're talking about uh, authentic partnerships with schools, we're going to begin before we talk about the partnerships that we've got, uh, just talking about why it's important that schools do create uh, strong partnerships. Doesn't have to be just industry partnerships, but that's what we're talking about today. So really important in, in this modern world where everyone is really busy, um, people are lurking long hours and probably spending a, a little bit less time with their, with their kids at home, that we have really good career uh, guidance at schools. And if you've got local employees, in your schools working with kids, that's going to give kids information about careers that they can have. So, you know, really important that we've got partnerships with our schools so kids can see in this local area, these are the really prominent careers that I can go into. It does allow industry to see what goes on in school. Sometimes uh, there's, a, there's a fair bit of difference between what happened at school 10, 20, 30 years ago that those industry people are in than what schools are today. Uh, they're a very different place. So it's, it's great for industry to see what's going on in schools and also for them to have some input uh, in what goes on in schools and, and creating who will be their future employees. Having industry working in with your classrooms means that students have got that direct access to what goes on in industry right here and now. So they're often talking about what they're doing, um, out at work, um, this is what happens now. Um, we used to do this, we now do this. Gives the, the kids a really good idea of what is happening right here and now and where it's heading in what direction. It's really great for our teachers um, when they're interacting with industry in their classrooms that they get a greater understanding of workplace expectations as well. Um, they often don't have a great understanding, so it's good for them to see what's going on. The modern teenager, the, the wonderful uh, person that they are, um, it really is about relevance for them. And, and, and it has always been, but probably even more so now. If, if, it's, if they don't see it relevant to them, they're not interested. So that what's in it for me bit, they need to see these are the careers that I can be going into tell me about what I can learn in that and, and get those connections um, with the employers right there and now. And then lastly, it's really, really good um, when you've got people coming in and sharing, that sets, I guess, the, the, the stage and the expectation that you give back. Uh, and so kids are seeing people giving back to them. And so when they get out uh, into the community, they go, well, I had people coming in and helping me. I want to go out and help as well. So create a, a situation where you've got communities that are, are giving back um, between industry giving back and locals giving back um, sets a really good positive tone to the community. So lots of different reasons why they're important. Uh, we've taken a lot of our work here at Blackwater State High School uh, in this from the Looking to the Future report. Um, you'll be able to find this um, if you want to have a read of it. Um, it's the report of the review of senior secondary pathways into work for their education and training. So back in June 2020, they put together a panel um, that looked at, I guess, the, the, the changing nature of workforce and training and industry and how this can all work together. Um, and we know that things are going really fast. And, and I, I found the quote right on the front of the Looking to the Future report um, quite amusing because it sounds exactly like it's written now. The world is moving at a tremendous rate, going no, no one knows where. We must prepare our children, not for the world of the past, not for our world, but for their world, the world of the future. And that was from the 1940s. So it, it, it's nothing new. This is something that's been going on for a long time, but we definitely have found as we head into the technological uh, revolution, uh, this is something we really have to prepare our kids for. 
And so in that report, it talks about the essential skills that students need to have going into the workplace. And we're talking about generally those soft skills that you can see there on the screen. We know they need to be digital, digitally literate. Um, to have life skills, interpersonal skills and communication, critical analysis, evaluation, teamwork, problem solving, resilience, um, planning an organisation, initiative, entrepreneurial skills and active citizenship. So these are often the skills that aren't necessarily, you know, in the curriculum per se, but sit behind and within activities that we do at all times in the curriculum. And we find that a lot of these partnerships uh, when you are working with industry, help to address and, and STEM uh, really address some of these essential skills well. So this particular piece of information um, is from the, the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs survey from 2020. And you can see that in this current age, the the hands-on jobs, the labourer jobs are decreasing in demand and we've got data analysis, um, you know, digital transformations, information security, software, robotics, all of those STEM type jobs uh, on the increase. And, and so that was back in 2020, um, also linked into the, the look into the future report. So it is really important that schools are working in this field because that's the jobs that our kids are going to need to go to. So that's our obligation. We need to make sure that we're preparing our kids for um, the workforce that's required um, and that they've got jobs that they can be ongoing to. Um, so we need to be teaching those skills and learning opportunities. So not just add-ons, but embedding them into our activities in our classrooms. And as I said, STEM subjects and programs do provide excellent opportunities for that. We also know, and we've had um, plenty of industries tell us this, that there's not enough supply in Australia for skilled workers. Um, for these jobs that are required and they go offshore to meet their demands. We, you know, we all know that we, when we get on the phones and we've got call centres and things, um, they go offshore. But also um, for programming and coding, um, they are going offshore. And that's not great for Australia. We need our kids to be able to go into those jobs. So we need to be preparing them for that. Uh, so there were two particular recommendations I want to flag in the Looking to the Future report, and they were recommendations 11 and 12, which are about industry bodies and education working together, formalising relationships so that there is engagement of industry in senior secondary schooling uh, and that we're fostering those partnerships between schools and employers. Um, right here in your own communities to help those students make choices and gain experience in all the career pathways that industries can offer. And those, those really embed, I guess, what, what Wendy and I work in on a daily basis in creating these partnerships for our kids. There are challenges uh, and in particular, some of the industry partnerships we have addressed these challenges. So in our rural areas, uh, both in Blackwater and, and Thurangawa and, and plenty of other rural areas around the country, generally the teachers that we get in don't come from the community. You know, when I, I joined Blackwater in 1997, I was coming from Brisbane. I did not know much about a mining community. So for me to then be talking to my students about careers that they might go into in their local community, um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for new teachers coming in and they need to get to know what careers are around here so that they can give kids guidance. And so having industry in the classrooms um, really helps there and helps upskill our teachers as well as upskilling our kids in those careers. We need to make sure we are skilling 
our kids for the skills that are required. So they are far in advance of the labour skills from previous generations. And we need to make sure our kids can be in coding and automation and data analysis and information security, those sorts of fields. And those skills are changing faster than the education sector is making allowances for in changes of curriculum. So it, it really is, I guess, the work Wendy and I are doing and, and plenty of other educators around the nation, you know, we're, we're forging the way in those changes um, and bringing those skills into the curriculum that we're delivering in our subjects. The great thing about senior secondary is you've got a bit of flexibility to do that. Industry does need to guide the education sector in those skills and attributes. So I know every year or every second year, I invite all of my um, local industry um, mine managers. It's not often the mine manager that comes. They, they often uh, delegate the job to come out to other people. But I meet with them and I talk about what's needed right now. What are you seeing when you've got kids coming out of school and coming to you or out of uni and coming to you, what, what are the gaps? What skills and attributes do you need? What skills and attributes are you finding they're not good in? And that allows us to create, um, I guess, some a guide of what we can deliver at school to help bridge that gap. The last challenge that we've got in all of this work as we all know is, is lots of interruptions to learning. And COVID-19 is just one of them. We all know that uh, currently we're in a teacher shortage. And if your school's anything like many of the others that I'm reading about, um, you've got teacher changes every couple of days. You've got um, you know teachers off for a week isolating. There's so many interruptions to learning at the moment. Long hours of parents working, um, we've got kids beginning primary school that know nothing about reading or writing to start off with. So they're, they're starting, you know, behind already. Kids that are missing significant periods of learning, you know, it, it's a lot for us to catch all of these kids up on. So, so the more we know from our, our employment sector about what they're looking for, the better it is. So I'm going to hand over to Wendy now to start talking about the, the project she's got in her school. Thank you, Rebecca, and good afternoon, everyone. Before I start talking about the Global Tropics Future Project, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm talking to you from today, the Wulgarukapa and Bindal people here in Townsville, North Queensland. Okay, now the Global Tropics Future Project was actually a collaboration between the Queensland Department of Education and James Cook University, and it's led by my school, Tharangawa State High School. And this partnership actually enables an alignment of strategies within both organisations to boost the outcomes and pathways in STEM within the tropics, North Queensland. And Rebecca has talked in great depth about why should we worry about STEM and so this was actually the driver that then led to the creation of the Global Tropics Future Project. So our vision is to boost engagement, lift outcomes and transform STEM aspirations of students in years five to nine in North Queensland. That was the original vision and it has changed quite a lot since then. And I'll talk about that soon. But our entire objective was to maximize the potential of gifted and capable students strengthen the outcomes for Indigenous students and improve outcomes of socio-economically disadvantaged and rural and remote students. So when students join our GTF project, they become young scholars and they're with us from year five right through to 12. And they are students who are like-minded and they have that passion and that drive for STEM. And they just, they're interested in what STEM encompasses. So as a young scholar, they connect, collaborate and explore this interest through a range of enriching and challenging learning opportunities. And they solve authentic STEM challenges with university, industry and community professionals. And they can actually build their STEM portfolio through a blend of face-to-face -face and virtual experiences. Now up on this slide here is our GTF Longitudinal Pathway. 
And the entire success of the GTF project lies within this pathway because students are accessing STEM enrichment opportunities from year five right through to 12 now. The first component there at our Queensland Virtual STEM Academy is the biggest component and it actually has shown the greatest impact because remember these students are years five to nine, but we also deliver face-to-face -face opportunities. We have specific STEM curriculum in years seven to 10, which is face-to-face. -face. And our school now has created a senior STEM subject with senior STEM and data science as the four areas there. But for today, um, we'll just talk about the Queensland Virtual STEM Academy component. And this Virtual STEM Academy, it, it actually enables students to connect, collaborate online, as you would have imagined. And it's delivery through, delivered through a virtual platform that is very different to what you would have experienced before. They tell me it's a little like Minecraft, but not that I've played Minecraft. Um, but the kids are really, really engaged in this environment. Our courses run for 10 weeks and they are offered for one lesson per week. So it's just like instrumental music where the students leave regular class to go and learn an instrument. Here they leave in class one lesson a week to do STEM enrichment. So we should be providing for these students as well. In each course, we have 15 to 20 students from roughly four to five schools. So we have students from a school, like they might be on their own, that they're the only student who likes STEM. Now they're able to be in a class of students just like them and join the same kinds of things. Now, this is our virtual platform without actually showing you in real time, real life. They're like little avatars that can move around inside the virtual space. And uh, your lesson has to be really on point to ensure that students are engaged all of the time and are doing the right thing as well but it's just like a real classroom and the students get to collaborate with each other from thousands of kilometres apart. Now, the Queensland Virtual STEM Academy in North Queensland last year delivered programs to 37 schools just in North Queensland. And 20 of those are from rural and remote locations. And that equated to 694 enrolments across 33 courses. Now to deliver one of these courses, you must have industry and university partners to make sure that learning is authentic. And last year we had 23 university and industry partners to help us deliver. Now the Queensland Virtual STEM Academy Network, just waiting for the slide to catch up to me, um, has now expanded to be across Queensland and we have five delivery sites across the state. So we have a delivery site at Smithfield State High School in Cairns, us here in Townsville, Rockhampton State High School in Rockhampton, the Queensland Academy of Science, Maths and Technology in Brisbane, and Roma Secondary College in um, Roma, Darling Downs. So we've really grown across in just a short amount of time, actually, since 2017. If we have a look at our school reach, in Queensland, you can see there that last year we delivered programs to just over 2,000 students and they came from 138 state schools. And just onto my next slide, if I expand out our map, you will see that we also include students from Darwin, New South Wales and Dunedin in New Zealand. And this partnership was made possible because of a very special connection um, I made with a, another teaching fellow um, where we created Australia New Zealand STEM Education Alliance. And in this particular class, we have students from Northern Territory, New South Wales, Queensland and New Zealand all learning from each other. And um, I learn a lot from them as well. I can also add here that as of two weeks ago, we now have students from Dubai in our courses. And really, really cool yesterday, I have to share. In one class, we had students from Townsville, Ingham, which is one hour north of Townsville, a student on a cattle station, which was 120 kilometers northwest of Winton, and students from Dubai. And they were all learning about soil health and they were analyzing their soil samples together and seeing the differences. And what's interesting as well is that I'm here in Townsville, but my teacher was in Ingham, one hour north of me. So anything is possible when you can do things online. 
and in actual fact, anything is possible. With the help of St George Foundation and Spy Grant and Australian Schools Plus, we've now created an Australian network of virtual STEM academies. So here I'd like to give a shout out to Ian and Scott from New South Wales because they have started their virtual STEM academy in, at Murrumbidgee Regional High School and have been going really, really well. And um, if you need any connections there, um, talk to Ian at, at New South Wales in Preston. Okay, now, so what are we actually delivering? What are we actually delivering? Well, here is a list of courses that we um, deliver. And we write these based on the experts that we have and the region that we are in and you know what focus we want the students to learn about. And the Kiss the Ground one down the bottom here, that's the one that the students were learning about yesterday with Dubai. So I'll just give you an example of a course that we have written. And we wrote this one for our ANZIA class and it's about cybersecurity. And we, cybersecurity is everybody's business. If you have a smartphone in your hand, cybersecurity must be one of your interests. And we also know that cybersecurity is one of the biggest, fastest growing career pathways that STEM needs to address. And so we created a grand challenge and we did this by collaborating with a large range of experts from all across the country. And we created the context together. And the reason why we co-design and co-deliver programs together is because then our, we have synergy between our goals and the outcomes that we want to achieve. And so it makes the program more successful if everyone is achieving what they would like to achieve. Wendy, may I interject there? Um, just in terms of tapping into that expertise at a really practical level, how do you access these people? Obviously, you know what you want to teach, but how do you actually go about finding them? <laughs> um, a lot of the time, it's about talking to people and sharing what you're trying to do and sharing what you're trying to achieve. And you find those people who are passionate about what you are as well. I have an example of our Disaster Resilience Grand Challenge where we had major floods here in Townsville and I recognised that, that, that need for our students to be resilient during natural disasters. And it was just an email that popped into my inbox from the council and they said, let's have a talk. And that created a massive Grand Challenge that has been hugely successful, even in New Zealand. Um, a lot of the times it's LinkedIn you're looking for, for experts there or with the university, I could write a, a course and say, look, I'm looking for a sustainability lecturer in this particular field and they, they support in that way. So it's really, yeah, talking, going to workshops and finding out who is passionate about what you are as well. Thanks, Wendy. That's okay, Bron, not a problem. Um, this picture here is of our ANZIA class. The mm -hmm. man top from the left is our New Zealand teacher. And the man top from the right, second top from the right, is Stephen, and he was working for IBM. So these connections here were made through um, the New South Wales Virtual STEM Academy as well when we created ANZIA. So we're all connected and we like to share and we like to um, be very creative. Now, at the end of every single course, every single course, we survey the students to find out what was good and what needs to be fixed. And one of the questions is, what was the most interesting or beneficial part of the course? Now we're talking about cybersecurity course and these are the comments that the students are making. So during the presentations, because I don't like getting in front of people and saying stuff, but in this class, everyone is respectful and I like that. And that's because these students are like-minded and they're coming together to work together. Usually these students are the ones in groups at school who are doing all the work for the group. But in these classes, they all, they all work together. So another beneficial part was learning about different aspects of cybersecurity and getting to know more about STEM. It helped me understand STEM better and improve my technology and science skills. Remembering that some students are logging onto our platform that have never touched a computer before because they're living in remote communities. For me, probably it was doing the online competition, trying to protect the water plant from the hackers. And the one we did with Will, it taught me a lot about lateral thinking and teamwork. 
Oh, now I have a special guest, Mick, and I'll just try and go back to that one. Um, he is a, a fantastic cybersecurity expert. And while he was doing his career presentation, the chat box was filling up. And so I just took a screenshot here and you can see Evie from New Zealand said, I found my future job. Nathaniel from Queensland, I found my job when I'm 14. <laughs> Aria from New Zealand, what ages can you get jobs like these? What's the best part of your job? And Dan from the NT, in capitals, where can I get a job like that? And I'll also add here, Mick was our guest in a lesson this morning and just the same impact that he was having. In fact, he almost converted one of my teachers to become a cybersecurity analyst. <laughs> so now on the next page, we, we also measure the student's collaboration skill development. And just two graphs here, we do a lot more, but I just thought I'd show two here. The orange line is post grand challenge and the blue line is before they start the grand challenge. The number one across the bottom is they show limited evidence of interpersonal and team related skills. And then number five across the bottom, they end up, it, it ends up being proficient. And when you look at the graphs, pre grand challenge, they are sitting around the limited evidence for interpersonal and team related skills. And then by the time they've finished, they, they're up to the developing. And then as they do another grand challenge, they could improve again. We always, always find the graphs are in this format. So these, they're actually learning to collaborate in the, the course. And now we are looking at critical thinking and measuring and developing that. Now, I've just written a few notes here because I think this was a question that had come up about productive partnerships. The best way to form a productive partnership is to ensure that you align your vision and strategic goals and you co-design and co-deliver learning experiences. I have written courses before and then tried to find the expert. It works, but not as well. It's, it's about doing things together. Make sure you find people who are passionate about what they are doing and they really lift the inspiration of the students. Always be in regular communication, always. Uh, so before the course, during the course, after the course. Solve issues together. Make sure that the partnership is such that you can share if there are any problems, but also remember to share and celebrate successes together because that then gives you the momentum to keep going. So that is it from me. Um, if you need anything, just contact me at any time. I'm on email nearly all day. Um, but I'm now going to pass over to Rebecca, who will talk about her industry partners a little more. Thank you very much, Wendy. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. All right, so um, I'm going to talk, oh, firstly, I'm going to say that I've had our students at our school um, as part of the Virtual STEM Academy as well. They loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, it it's, they love getting into contact with kids from other places as well. Um, and, and often they're not always the most um, open kids, but when they're in that safe environment, yeah, they really love it. So awesome job, Wendy. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of the partnerships uh, that I've been involved in uh, across many years um, out here at Blackwater and, and up in Moranbar. Uh, and the first one is the Queensland Minerals and Energy, Energy Academy. And they've probably been an absolute backbone to my career and, and great resource for me across the years. Um, I've worked with them for a very long, well, pretty much since, since they first came about um, and they've been really useful as a resource. So, so if you are in Queensland, um, you can just Google Queensland Minerals and Energy Academy and, and get in touch with them, they're great. They are um, funded and, and sourced through the Queensland Resources Council. So they have Queensland Resources Council partners uh, that fund the academy and also support the initiatives that they do. Um, so it's all about STEM in the resources sector. Um, and it, it is Australia's largest and most successful industry led schools industry initiative. Um, and uh, they were also showcased in that looking to the future report uh, that I talked about earlier. Um, so they work directly with students and teachers 
um, around the resources sector and they they do both uh, the vocational side of things as well as the academic side of things. So kids going into trades as well as kids going into um, paraprofessional and professional pathways for university. And, and in the last few years, they've really strengthened their work with female students and Indigenous students, um, as well as programs uh, for all students as well. Um, they, over the years, definitely um, develop and refresh their programs uh, with industry need um, and based on industry feedback. And, and as Wendy said, um, everything that they do is in partnership with industry and industry giving um, their, their advice and, and helping guide as well. So QSmart was a subject that I wrote. So it stands for the QMEA's Science, Maths and Relevant Technologies and Related Technologies. Uh, and it, it was a long time coming. So pretty much early in my career, uh, I came out to Blackwater State High School. Uh, in my second year of teaching, I started teaching physics. And I had a number of kids in my physics, my first physics class that I had that wanted to be electricians. Um, and of course they said, you know, you need to be doing physics to be an electrician. The issue is, is that whilst there is some, a small amount of physics that's based around electricity, there's a large amount of physics that's not based around ele electricity. You know, they're sitting there doing Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics and, and various different things. And I, I would sit there and I would look at my class and, and I had those kids in there that I knew wanted to become electricians and they were incredibly stressed. They were struggling to pass those other units. They did great in the electricity units, um, but really struggled with the rest of physics. And, you know, back when I first started teaching, that was, that was fine. But nowadays we've got in Queensland, the Queensland Certificate of Education, and they don't get points towards earning their senior certificate if they're not passing. And so if, if they're sitting in those subjects not passing, that becomes a bit of an issue. So I, I sort of had a bit of a talk to, to some of my admin. You know, I was literally 22, 21, 22 years old at this point, so I didn't know much, uh, and, and said, look, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing these kids that are really, really stressed. They're talking about dropping out of the subject, but I don't want them to drop out because they're, they're not going to get into their trade. What can we do? And the first thing that we came across was... Um, a lot of these kids were also studying a manufacturing certificate at the time, and they could earn some credit towards that manufacturing certificates through some um, national broad based modules that are now known as VET. Um, and they were doing electrical fundamentals and engineering science were ones that counted that I said, you know what, these are great units um, that would really help. So I was delivering that um, as, as a bit of an add on program to some of these kids. Uh, but more and more, I sort of thought to myself, I really, really want the perfect subject for these kids isn't physics. It's a subject that is a little bit of physics, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of uh, back then it was maths A, a little bit of maths B, all mixed together in the one subject. And, and it could be really uh, written so that it was directly relevant to the local industries. So I guess this was a bit of a pipe dream of mine back in the time I could see very stressed kids and I'm going, I, I want this to happen. So it wasn't really until 2005 when the Queensland Minerals and Energy Academy was established, we were a partner school up in Moranbar, um, that I went, hey, listen, this is something that I've been talking about for a long time. I also really wanted to have some sort of a, an opportunity for kids before they got into senior to, to do some work with industry. And at that time, um, the QMEA rep at my school said, hey, listen, I'm part of the QMEA. We might be able to put this together. We put together a challenge day. Um, it was the BMA Women in Mining group that helped me organise that at the time. We came up with some challenges uh, related to processes in the mines. We had some partner schools across the region all come together and, and do a challenge day. Uh, we had industry mentors come in and work with the kids 
and they um, helped them. They also talked about their careers um, and the QMEA building on that um, have, have developed a whole suite of programs going from year seven all the way through to year 12 in um, professional pathways and trade pathways for girls, for um, Indigenous to help with that. So in the end, they went, you know what, I, th I agree, let's write this program with that bit of math, that bit of physics, that bit of chemistry. Um, and so we got a whole heap of people, uh, mostly from the Gladstone region, but a couple of Bowen Basin coal mines. Um, so trade reps to get together to write that. So they came up with the content that they wanted to see included in the development. Um, and that was put together in a program. We had to go to the Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority to get that approved. Um, so it was approved, but back then, they only approved it for, for preparatory points. And we went, well, that's not gonna work for schools for QCE points. So we, we split it up into two courses. One was a prep course, one was an enrichment course. If you're in Queensland, you'll know, know that is complimentary. Uh, and so uh, then the resources were written. So I wrote all of those. I wrote sample assessment. I wrote learning plans, teaching sequences, um, different activities that you can do, model solutions. Um, again, in consultation with industry, um, experiments that they can do hands-on practical. Uh, but the great thing about this subject is that it, it works at Gladstone at an aluminum smelter or at a port. It works in Blackwater and Moranbar in a mine. Um, there's there's a school up in Townsville or a trade centre up in Townsville that run it for all of their um, tradies that they're training up there. So it, it you just adjust the learning experiences to your local context. And again, get on board with your industry partners to do that. So that's, that's one partnership. Uh, another partnership that we're involved with here is the Bright Minds Partnership. Um, which is a long-term partnership between um, the BMA mines and the 18 different primary and high schools across the Bowen Basin in central Queensland. So uh, BMA have put up $5 million to go out to these 18 schools um, and their aim is to focus on technology and future skills to give both the students um, to engage them to go into those careers, to give them the skills that they need, uh, but also to support schools uh, in, in delivering quality programs to their students around that. So, so they'll pay for professional development um, for teachers. They'll get um, different trainers to come in and run programs as well. So you can see uh, there's a little snapshot of central Queensland there. They're the 18 schools that are involved uh, in the partnership. And, and the amount that you get per year depends on your school numbers. Um, and then as a school, we get to choose what we do with that money, but we also get together with some of our cluster schools um, to form partnerships around what we, we use with it as well. Uh, so. Education Queensland also gets involved. We've got local reps from our region that come and help um, drive our, our improvement plans with that money. Um, and it, it is the second partnership that we've had with BMA. That was the partnership they identified as important because it, it was aimed at the skills they needed. Our previous partnership, um, which again was across the whole of central Queensland, was a read partnership that was about uh, literacy skills. So very quickly, um, I'm just going to show you a really quick um, video around that partnership. So just give me a second to share that. About three, two minutes. About yep. two minutes. Oh, where have they gone here? Oh, no, maybe I'm not because my video isn't showing now. Um, I'll just go back and share that one again. So I'll, I'll pop over into uh, some other partnerships. So we've got a cert certificate to an automation partnership. Um, so that's between Blackwater High, Moranbar and Dysart along with BHP Central Queensland Uni in TAFE Queensland and our kids are training up in a certificate to in automation. 
Um, so they're due to complete at the end of this year. Uh, and that's one that we really felt was valuable in our local region with the change from um, truck drivers to autonomous haulage. Um, and this, this certificate was actually designed for the staff at the mines to train up. Um, but we said, right, we want some of our kids involved in this. And so they've gone on board. Um, and now all QMEA schools can do that as well. And then the last partnership I quickly want to talk about is our Certificate to an Engineering Pathways Partnership. It's a really critical one for our school, uh, as probably your all experience as well, uh, that teachers in ITD in that manual arts area are few and far between these days. You can't get them. And Engineering Pathways, Certificate to an Engineering Pathways was our most popular senior subject. Pretty much all of our boys and a lot of our girls would want to go on and do that if they were heading down a trade pathway. Uh, and unfortunately, our engineering teacher left us at the end of 2020. And so we were sitting there going, we don't know what we're going to do because uh, we weren't going to be able to get another teacher. And so we were sitting here thinking, what can we do? We, we can't do this, we're not gonna get a teacher, but we can't lose this subject, it's too important. And, and we went, well, it's not gonna to hurt to ask, let's pick up with our contacts in the mines and go, is there anything we can do with the partnership where maybe a tradie can come and help out um, and our kids do a, the actual certificate theory through a, an RTO uh, and, our, we just thought we'd throw the question out there, see what can happen. And our wonderful friends at BMA uh, said, yes, absolutely. Um, and we've got someone for you. We've got a qualified tradie who works with our apprentices, wants to come out and, and help. Uh, and so they send us that person every Thursday. Uh, we have engineering running for the first two classes of Thursday and then another class, the second two classes of Thursday. They do all their prac through that time. Um, and we also have a past student who was an apprentice that went, hey, I'll come and help too. So that's, that's part of that giving back. He comes every Thursday as well now. Um, and they work with our kids. The kids love it, but those um, people that come out the mines, they absolutely love it as well. They love to get to know the kids to make sure they're learning what they need them to learn at the time. Uh, so um, they, they really love it. Um, and the great thing is that uh, that apprentice that's been coming and helping out, he's, he's about to finish his trade. He actually is now saying he's changed his mind. He wants to become a, a, an ITD teacher now. So fingers crossed. We may have solved that problem for Blackwater State High School for the future. We will see. Great story. Rebecca, thank you. Um, you, you've wrapped up there. Sorry, I, I did cut you off a little bit there, but um, thank you so much um, for so generously sharing um, those stories. Terrific examples um, on so many levels of, of how partnerships can can work, and not it's a two way. It's part very much a partnership as you've you've just illustrated. Look, what I would like to do is just pass to now. Um, we'll move to our Q and A for a few moments, and. I do see one question there and Wendy, I wonder if I can bother you with this. Um, Donna has reached out and asked the question, can you tell me or tell us more about your metric for critical thinking and are you able to share it? So over to you, Wendy, if I can. <laughs> Not a problem. Now we're only just beginning to delve into the critical thinking aspects of our green challenges. Um, but we're looking at going down the same pathway as our collaboration and we um, model off Fulham's work where we, we have a criteria and a matrix from Fulham where we are measuring that at the beginning of the course and at the end. And during the course, we have particular strategies that we use for each of the dimensions of the criteria. Um, so, yeah, we are looking at Fulham's work for critical thinking as well. And uh, who knows, then we could probably go on to creativity. But we also recognise that in each grand challenge, we can't be measuring everything and developing every skill. So 
the skill that we um, will be developing is dependent upon the grand challenge and the topic and the pedagogical approach really. And um, we, we will have a toolkit of measuring influence and development influence. Yeah, thanks very much, Wendy, really appreciate that. Um, I do invite any other questions to, be, if you would like to ask uh, Wendy or Rebecca, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat and, and we can pick them up. But what I might do actually, Rebecca, if I could pass one to you that um, came through prior to the actual session. Well, in fact, now a little bit more generally, um, I get, and I'll ask you this of you too, Wendy, actually. Um, both of you obviously saw a need in your communities, um, which sort of kick-started your work and have led that change. And, you know, we know a lot about school leadership and that is critical to, to, to affecting effective change. If there's one thing, one thing, one piece of advice that um, from your learnings, from your experience that you would share, what, what would it be? Uh, for me, it would be don't be afraid to ask. Um, I think we we really asked big, particularly with that tradie coming to be a teacher. Um, and we, we honestly thought they would say no. Um, but almost every time I've asked, somebody has said, you know what, yep, we're absolutely happy to help. Um, you know, they, they do see the importance on, on giving back and, and giving to education. So it might seem crazy. It might seem harebrained. How is this? They're never going to go with this, but you'll be surprised. Yeah, look, thank you. Thank you for that. Don't be afraid to ask. It's good mm. advice. <laughs> Wendy? Uh, my piece of advice is to have a, a team of people working with you. And from that, it's all about leading people guiding them but also walking alongside them uh, I uh, you know there's many networks that we have here with the QVSA and the AVSA and I still teach classes so that I have an understanding of what's happening in the on, online platform mm -hmm. and I also teach classes because I co-teach with new people it's not a way of you, you just go and do this that's what we're doing we work together and that's, that's the only way really to be successful in something is to do things together. Yeah, thank you. So working as a team, bringing people along the journey. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Wendy, there is another question in the chat for you uh, from Adrian. Um, so I might, if I can, just double, double down on you. Do you use the student version of the new pedagogies for deep learning and have the students self-assess on their rubric or is it teacher-led? Oh, that's a really good question. I have tried the student um, version where the, they assess themselves, um, but that takes a lot of unpacking of the, the criteria. And there, with one lesson per week, it just was a lot to, to do, especially if the, the lessons are only one hour. Mm -hmm. So we then tried the teacher version and that worked really well in that we only selected four accessible elements and each accessible element is what we're teaching the students about. Rather than doing the whole lot, we just focus in on four. And if you look at the criteria, there's quite a fair few there. Um, and so we just teach the students those four. And we say, this is what we're looking at now. And this is what we're going to be developing now. So yes, we tried the student. It was just a lot, especially year five and six. Yeah, thank you. And, and the students obviously respond. To that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, look, one of the questions that did, thank you, Wendy, and thanks, Adrian, for the question. One of the questions that came through also, if I can, um, and maybe to, when, uh, to Rebecca, just a response from um, parents. So we've talked a lot about community and, and, and partnerships there. What has been the response of parents to the work that you've been leading? Yeah, the, the parents are really happy. Um, I know with the QSmart program, I've had parents say to me, you know, this was one the only, one of the only reasons that my child actually managed to make it through to the end of year 12. That was the only subject they thought was actually relevant to them. Um, you know, so having it where they can see exactly where it can be used out in the workforce, um, the parents really liked that. Um, we've had students that have actually moved to our school 
so that they can be part of that Cert to Engineering Pathways program Mm because they knew at the school that they were going to be at, they they weren't going to get that direct contact with industry. Um, you know, so when, when a parent's prepared to pick up a, a, a child from a private school and move them 200 kilometres to, to a state school in central Queensland, um, just so that they could be direct contact with industry in their learning, they knew that was the pathway they wanted to go. Um, yep, yeah, this is going to be the school that I want my child to go to. So, so really positive. Yeah, look, look, thank you, Rebecca. And Wendy, just very briefly, anything to add there just from your experience? from that pet parental perspective? Um, from my experience, everything is positive from parents and students. And I received the most lovely emails from parents telling me how you know, their daughter is now interested in engineering and they're studying um, the subjects that they need at high school. So mm-hmm. it's building that inspiration and aspiration while they're young yeah. and keep bouncing that ball. Yeah. Terrific. Look, um, fantastic way to finish the presentation, I think, <laughs> building that aspiration and um, and just igniting a passion, I think, in students. And certainly through the stories that you have shared with us today of your, your experiences in your communities, um, you're absolutely doing that on so many levels. Um, and as I mentioned right at the very beginning, you know, the innovation, uh, the courageousness too, um, I think, in which you, you've tackled a problem and as you said Rebecca just just being willing to to answer ask that question and not being afraid of it um all obviously with the uh intent of providing great opportunities for the students that um, you have care of so thank you so much for what you're doing thank you so much for sharing so generously this afternoon um i'm sure for those who who are online this afternoon um There are many things that you are going to take away um, and please, um, we'd love to hear it. If there's, you know, if there's one takeaway, if you'd like to share that in the chat before you you head off this afternoon, we'd really love to hear it and get a sense of the things that really resonated for you this afternoon. But look, um, so yes, so Rebecca and Wendy, enormous thank you for your contribution this afternoon that we've really valued it. Um, I would also like to thank uh, my colleagues, as always, uh, Honor and Danny, for their support uh, behind the scenes in helping us to bring the webinar series to you, and in particular this afternoon's webinar with Wendy and Rebecca. Thank you both um, for what you do. As I've mentioned, um, um, on the 20th of June, there is um, our next webinar um, in the series with Jessica Chesterfield and Hayley Duro. Um, it will focus on uh, student voice and uh, and also community voice um, as as means to um, as way of improving uh, teaching and learning in school communities and enriching those experiences. So please, if it's of interest, we'd love you to to join us. Um, we will also, folks, send a link um, to you in the next week within the next week um, of the presentation tonight. So we invite you to share that more broadly with your colleagues as well if you think it's of of relevance to them. So on that note, uh, again, warmest thanks to both Rebecca and Wendy uh, for sharing so generously. And thank you everyone online for joining us this afternoon. Um, Great to have you uh, with us. Thank you and have a lovely evening.